So basically, tremors are extremely common, and um, sometimes it's difficult to understand uh, or be sure whether the tremor is actually a disease or whether it's a spectrum from what is normal and then kind of um, becomes possibly a symptom and a disease. Because um, I don't know if any of you have ever had a tremor, uh, but I've had tremors. And I don't think I have a disease. It's, it's what we call a physiologic tremor. So for instance, right now, I'm standing in front of you, so I'm nervous. And so I'm, sh I'm a little shaky. So I have tremors, but these are physiologic tremors. Now, I usually have a couple of uh, cups of tea in a day, but if I were to drink 10 cups of tea, then I would definitely become shaky and would have a tremor. Um, and that most probably would apply to most people. Um, there are many stressors in life that can make a, a person who is otherwise not tremulous or shaky uh, become tremulous. So with that, I would like to maybe go uh, slowly into what is considered a disease or a symptom. So basically, tremors are extremely common. And um, sometimes it's difficult to understand uh, or be sure whether the tremor is actually a disease or whether it's a spectrum from what is normal and then kind of um, becomes possibly a symptom and a disease. Because um, I don't know if any of you have ever had a tremor, uh, but I've had tremors. And I don't think I have a disease. It's, it's what we call a physiologic tremor. So for instance, right now, I'm standing in front of you, so I'm nervous. And so I'm, sh I'm a little shaky. So I have tremors, but these are physiologic tremors. Now, I usually have a couple of uh, cups of tea in a day, but if I were to drink 10 cups of tea, then I would definitely become shaky and would have a tremor. Um, and that most probably would apply to most people. Um, there are many stressors in life that can make a, a person who is otherwise not tremulous or shaky uh, become tremulous. So with that, I would like to maybe go uh, slowly into what is considered a disease or a symptom. All right, so this is the definition of tremors. And uh, tremors are defined as a rhythmic movement. So if my hand is very stable and still, it is not exhibiting a rhythmic movement. But if it were to start doing this, then this would be called a tremor. And it's, the definition is that it's a non-intentional non-volitional movement, a rhythmic movement of a body part, which is a result of alternating or irregular synchronous contractions of muscle that have an opposite effect on a joint. So for instance, if I have a hand tremor, then I have the wrist joint here and the joints in my hand, and then I have muscles in the top part of my hand and my arm, and I have muscles here. So if I don't have a tremor, then there is like a perfect balance between the muscles that make my hand and my fingers go this way and the muscles that make the hand and the fingers go this way. But if this perfect balance is not there, then the hand starts to shake up and down you know, across various joints and the muscles start to kind of contract um, in, in the tremor. So basically, uh, tremors are classified in, in two basic categories, the physiologic tremors, which are really not uh, from a disease, but you know what I uh, mentioned earlier. And then there are the pathologic tremors, tremors that are occurring because there is some sort of a, a disease process that's going on that is producing the tremor. And then, you know, when a person has a tremor, one of the first questions that the doctor, the family practitioner, the internist or the neurologist asks is where is the location of the tremor in the body, whether it's in the head, whether it's, it's in the neck, the voice, the mouth, the hands, the body or the legs. Sometimes all areas are affected and sometimes certain areas are affected more or primarily affected. And if that's the case, then that gives us clues about what the cause of the tremor is. Another thing that's very important to try and 
um, decide is whether the tremor is predominantly present at rest, meaning not when I'm sleeping, but for instance, while like you all of you are sitting down in a relaxed, hopefully a relaxed fashion, or if I'm watching TV and I'm thinking about something else, and I'm kind of in a relatively uh, like a like a position of rest, you know, then a part of the body starts shaking. So then that is called a tremor at rest. Then the tremor can be predominantly present when a body part is being uh, used. So that type of a tremor is called an action tremor or a kinetic tremor. So for instance, if, I, if you ask me to hold this pen like this in front of you, so instead of my hand being stable and uh, me having the ability to do this without having a tremor, if it starts to shake like this, then this would be called a kinetic tremor or an action or a movement tremor. Um, the kinetic tremors are divided into two categories. One, they are postural. So for instance, if, I, if you ask me to maintain a posture like this in front of me, if I extend my hands in front of me like this and my hands start to shake, then that's a postural tremor. If I try and use my hands, let's say to write or to type, and then my hands start shaking, or if I try and perform a task that requires dexterity, and I, my hands start to shake, for instance, if I try and do my buttons and my hands start to shake, if I pick up something heavy, uh, tasks that require gross uh, you know, activities, of uh, gross movements of the muscles, then those would be called kinetic or action tremors. And it's important to try and distinguish between these because often the causes are different. There are two other categories, intention or ataxic tremors, and I'll, I'll just mention them a little bit later. And then there is a tremor, a rare tremor called a rubral tremor. But the resting tremor, the first category, the second one, the postural action tremor, these are probably the commonest type of tremors, and I will spend a little bit more time on them. Resting tremors, in particular, are usually present in conditions like Parkinson's disease, or in people who have uh, syndromes or conditions that look like Parkinson's. So like a broad term is a Parkinsonian tremor. There are many types of Parkinsonian tremor. One of them is from Parkinson's disease, and then there are other causes of Parkinsonian tremors as well. And then the second category, the postural or action tremors are extremely common much more common than Parkinsonian tremors. And there is one condition that is called a, an essential benign familial tremor. And that is probably of all the tremors that you know I'll be talking about, that is the commonest one. Um, it's extremely common, often not diagnosed because it's mild and often people think that, you know, I'm just a little shaky. That's that's how I am. And they never bring it, um, you know, they never tell their physicians about it. And, um, you know, they just um, think of it as a peculiarity or, you know, that's the way they are. But it's extremely common and, you know, it's important to bring it up to your physician if a person has a tremor because sometimes just small adjustments in a person's lifestyle, decreasing, you know, how much caffeine you consume, how you sleep, how much they, um, you know, their, their kind of emotional state is such that that is producing a tremor. And it's important to um, know what the characteristics of a non-psychogenic tremor are and what um, the characteristics of a psychogenic tremor are because you definitely do not want to label a person who has a non-psychogenic tremor a psychogenic one because the treatments uh, and the approach is absolutely different. <clears throat> so I'll um, spend a, a little time talking about Parkinson's disease. Um, has anyone uh, over here, is anyone, uh, do you know of anybody who has Parkinson's disease? If, if anybody has anyone? All right, very good. So uh, Parkinson's disease uh, can cause tremors. Uh, a classic Parkinsonian tremor is a tremor at rest. Usually it is seen in one hand or one arm and one leg. And sometimes as the disease progresses, it can affect all the limbs, but usually it begins in one limb or on one side of the body. 
Sometimes it can also affect the chin. Um, it usually does not affect the head. It usually does not affect the voice. If the tremor is predominantly affecting the voice and the head, and if it's not at rest but predominantly with posture or with movement, then it is unlikely to be a Parkinsonian tremor. It is more likely to be an essential tremor or some other form of tremor. The Parkinsonian tremor is present at rest and it is a slow tremor. So we also, when we come across a tremor, we try and uh, decide what is the frequency at which that body part is moving. So there is a range of about two to three hertz per second to about 15 to 20 hertz per second. So a Parkinsonian tremor is generally between three to five hertz per second and it's a slow tremor and it usually is a, what is called a pill rolling tremor. So for instance if I have a um, some beads in my hand and if I'm trying to roll those beads you know this would be like a classic Parkinsonian tremor it, that's why it's called a pill rolling tremor so that and then another thing that happens with the Parkinsonian tremor is the hand particularly in the forearm pronates and supinates so it's like a pronation supination tremor and a, uh, a pill rolling tremor in the in the hand and in the thumb and the fingers um, in the chin also, if it affects the chin, then again, it's a, a slow tremor. So you can actually can see that, you know, the chin kind of moving in a, in a, in a rhythmic fashion, in a, in a slow manner. If the person tries to use the body part, so let's say that there is a pin rolling tremor, a pronation supination tremor at rest in the hand, and, and if you ask the person to hold a, a, a cup of tea, you know, then they can do that and the, the tremor often goes away and the tremor is suppressed. They can also suppress the tremor for a little bit uh, volitionally. So if you ask a person who has Parkinson's disease to suppress a tremor, they can do that for a few seconds, you know, and then as soon as they are distracted and then, you know, they think about something else and the tremor starts again. It's the opposite with uh, an essential tremor. So the more they try and suppress it, the shakier they get. So, you know, if you if they are if they become nervous and you, you put them on the spot and you ask them to suppress the tremor, they're going to become even, you know, shakier. So so the opposite happens. Now, Parkinson's disease is, is, is not an uncommon condition. Uh, approximately 10 million people are affected worldwide. It's generally a non-genetic condition, sporadic, no family history in the majority of people, 80 to 90 percent of people, no family history. It affects many parts of the nervous system. It causes motor system uh, symptoms. It causes cognitive and behavioral symptoms. It causes autonomic nervous system uh, related symptoms. And tremor is just one component of it. So tremor affects the motor system. Other things that can happen, people can develop, uh, the handwriting can become smaller, their balance and posture can get affected, they can fall down because of the imbalance that they have, they often become stooped, they can ha they, their body movements become slow and if you feel their arms, they are stiff, so they, ha they have like a resistance when you try and feel the tone of their muscles. As the condition progresses, um, uh, actually the tremor often occurs during the first few years. Um, of a you know a Parkinsonian disorder and as the condition progresses often it becomes um, less as time goes by. Um, I will not go into the details of the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease but if anybody is interested you know I, I can try and answer a question if, if, um, if you wish. Now this is kind of a, a diagram of um, the brain looking at certain structures from the front. So, um, so if you look at the top part, so there's the, the diagram, and then if you look at the top part, that's kind of the cerebral cortex or the upper part of our brains. This area is called the, the cerebral cortex. And then if you go down, this area where the, the, the red nuclei are, and then as you go down, that's called the brainstem. So in Parkinson's disease, basically this area, the, the black area, that's called the substantia nigra, there is a loss, an accelerated loss of neurons in that area. 
and because of that the motor symptoms the physical symptoms of parkinson's disease occur which includes the tremor and this area in particular the black area the substantia nigra connects you know through neurons and their extensions to various other parts of the brain so these connect to the higher parts of the brain they connect to the lower parts of the brain and the circuitry of um, the nuclei that lie in the deeper parts of the brain that are called the basal ganglia, you know, they are in particular affected in Parkinson's disease and they result in the, the various types of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease which include the tremors. Now there are other areas in the brain that are affected in Parkinson's disease that cause cognitive problems, memory problems, um, behavioral uh, emotional problems, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders. People develop problems with controlling uh, urine, um, controlling uh, the blood pressure, dizziness. So there are so many different parts of the nervous system can, that can get affected in, in a person with Parkinson's disease and it depends upon which part gets affected and that causes you know, the symptom. This is a, a diagram of that same area that that you know that dark area that I was showing. This is actually um, um, a, a slice of the brain in a normal person, and this is the the one below is in a person with Parkinson's disease. And both these people died, and you can see that this area is much lighter, and that's because there is loss of these dopaminergic neurons in that area. And then these sections basically show. Um, a normal uh, close-up view of that area and this is an area with the loss of those neurons which are rich in this pigment uh, in, um, uh, in the substantia nigra that causes the dark color and this particular cell um, is like a pathognomonic uh, uh, kind of a, a cell that's seen you know in people with Parkinson's disease that's called the Lewy body and in that too is the kind of a pretty characteristic thing in Parkinson's so once again i'm going to kind of um, uh, you know browse through this and so uh, substantia nigra pars compacta if you do pet studies in such patients you see kind of a loss of neurons and um, as you know as people age people who have parkinson's disease you know in in actually in all of us as we become older there is a loss of neurons in our nervous system that happens with normal aging but in parkinson's disease and in other neurodegenerative neurodegenerative disorders like alzheimer's for instance and some other disorders there are certain parts of the brain where the the loss of those neurons is accelerated so for instance if I am, let's say, 70 years old, and because I'm 70, my, and this is just a hypothetical number, if my cells are going to become 70 compared to 100, if I were like 30 years old, then if I have Parkinson's disease, then that, that number may be 30 instead of 70 in the substantia nigra pass compactor. And then I'm likely to have symptoms. But if I have 70, then those are enough. I mean, I, do, I will not have, have symptoms because uh, those are enough for, uh, for me to kind of compensate and not have any um, symptoms at all. So, um, you know, unfortunately, this, is, uh, this video is not playing, but I'll tell you about this patient of mine. She had a Parkinsonian tremor um, in one upper extremity, uh, the right hand in particular. And, you know, one thing that I do want to mention is that um, when patients with Parkinson's disease take their medications, then the tremor often uh, goes away. And then when the medications wear off, then the tremor becomes manifest again. So one of the challenges that you know, we as neurologists and physicians have is that as time goes by, the, 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 um, the effectiveness of the medications become less. And also the duration, um, you know, the, uh, so for instance, if the medications were going to last for, let's say, eight hours or 12 hours earlier on in the course of the illness, then they start to wear off earlier and earlier. But then, you know, there are many treatments that are available and uh, patients can respond to medication adjustments. And actually there's a surgery now that can be done that's called deep brain stimulation. And that in particular yeah, can really control tremors very well. 
So what are the treatments that are available in, uh, for people with a Parkinsonian tremor? There are various medication classes, and you know I, I will not go into the details. You know unless you want me to, you, you know, let me know if you want me to. But there are ma major you know medication classes. One of them is called uh, one one of the, those classes um, is called dopamine agonists. Another class is called levodopa, carbidopa, or cinemet. You know that is quite effective in controlling tremors. There is another uh, class which is called uh, anticholinergics. You know they actually control tremors quite well in patients, but it's often hard to use them because they often cause side effects. Also, uh, it's easier to use them in younger people um, who have Parkinson's. Um, but as be uh, people become older, then you know they cause more side effects than, um, than they help. So it's harder to use them. There is another medication called amantadine and that is used in Parkins Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian disorders uh, quite uh, commonly. And that particular medication seems to be more effective for tremor. Um, so amantadine, anticholinergics and cinemet or levodopa, carbidopa. These are the three major uh, categories that seem to help tremors more than the other classes that are used. Now there is this surgery called deep brain stimulation. Has has is anybody familiar with that? Have you heard about it? Deep brain stimulation, mm -hmm. and uh, do you know of anybody who's had that done? Uh, any friend, family, anyone? No. Okay. So it's it's actually a very very exciting. Um, uh, you know, type of treatment. It, it, it was introduced some years ago. Now it's FDA approved for Parkinson's disease. It's FDA approved for essential tremor and it's FDA approved for another uh, type of a movement disorder called dystonia. It works great if the patient that is chosen is the right one. So you have to have the right diagnosis and also you have to have the right um, the stage of the of the condition. So, for instance, if the Parkinson's disease is really advanced, and if the patient is not really responding anymore to the Parkinsonian medications, in particular, the tremor is not responding anymore. Maybe it was ten years ago, but at this point in time, they're not really. It's not really responding. Then the chances of uh, improving with the surgery are also pretty low so the right candidate has to be chosen for the surgery and it also so the right disease right the right candidate who has that disease and the right stage of the disease so all those are very very important and then also the the technical part of the surgeries is, is extremely important so the, the surgeon and the team has to be properly trained you know, experienced and it has to be done in a center which also has experience because after the surgery has been done correctly, then uh, then there is a like a stimulator, like a pacemaker that is put inside the body, body underneath the collarbone and that is connected with a wire that is connected to a probe which goes down into the deeper parts of the brain and there is a tiny tiny little electrode that you can barely see with your naked eye and that is placed on like one particular spot in the in the deeper part of the brain and if that tip of that electrode is in the right part then and and you know when the surgery is done the patient is awake you know it's it's remarkable so you you know you go into the operation theater the patient is awake the 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 probe the electrode is not in the right place so what you do what we do is we ask the patient to put their hand let's say in in the front and the hand is shaking like this so the probe is not at the right spot but then as soon as it's put in the right spot and it's turned on so from a shaking like this the hand stops shaking so it truly like works like magic so it has to be put in the right spot and once the surgery has been done then this pacemaker is actually controlled with the help of an external magnet so the patient would come to my office and i would actually control the pacemaker with an external magnet and i would actually adjust the parameters of the the impulses that that um, pacemaker is producing and sending to that particular spot you know in the deeper part of the brain and if i do the adjustments right and if i balance 
um, the stimulation from the deep brain stimulator with the medications just perfectly you know then the chances of like you know producing like a really good result are there but you know it's not always uh, possible to get the perfect result but in i would i would say that if if all of these um you know um things are done right then in in the majority of people this translates into a huge improvement in the quality of life of the patient is that just for parkinson's is that for uh, just regular travelers for both actually um, generally the deep brain stimulation uh, surgery works better the best for essential tremors uh, because in people who have essential tremor it's mainly the tremor that is there they don't have other symptoms you know they don't have behavioral cognitive you know all all the other things that are also happening in parkinson's disease how long the hospitalization is it for an essential tremor that's a question um he he's asking uh, how long is the hospitalization for somebody who gets the surgery done for essential tremor uh, that's what you're asking so that's uh, um, i would say about 3 days 3 to 4 days um sometimes earlier sometimes longer depending upon the age and you know what else is happening but it's not long at all you know you um, it's it's you don't even get like general anesthesia it's like a local anesthesia it's really remarkable if you if you get an opportunity you know look that up on the web or on youtube or something and you can actually see the whole surgery and it's really remarkable you know what what is possible At what so, point do you do this deep brain stimulation in uh, someone with essential tremors? Um you know it really depends upon how they've responded to the the medications you know so if the medications are controlling the tremor reasonably well um I think that you do, really don't need to consider surgery but in some people even you know the best medication combinations the optimal doses you know they they help the medications help but not enough and then still their quality of life is affected significantly so that would be a good candidate and sometimes patients just can't tolerate the medications they get they get uh, side effects that they can't tolerate you know i have this lady um you know it's really sad she was a um, uh, she's in the entertainment she was in the entertainment industry she was um um in the movie business basically handling um uh, the cameras and you know or the the photography part uh, of the uh, uh, you know in the entertainment business um and her she has like one of the severest forms well not one of the severe a severe form of of essential tremor and with that she has um a, a, a very severe case of depression there is an, and this is familial depression you know there's there've been suicides that have been committed in her family some some family members have had bipolar disorder some people like very severe uh, depression and she has also been depressed most of her life so a combination of essential tremor and um severe depression and she has not been able to tolerate uh, an essential tremor medication because it has caused excessive drowsiness she just ca- cannot function you know with with um, um you know there are the medications that are uh, very very effective in people uh, who have essential tremor and she cannot take uh, an antidepressant because practically every antidepressant that she has tried makes her tremor worse mm-hmm. you know so she's been you know eventually she had to uh, she, she stopped working and she went on early um disability now she is somebody who would respond i think to uh, deep brain stimulation and you know i started seeing her um i don't know around maybe 2000 uh, 1 2002 something like that i started seeing her and this is 2014 and i have still not been able to convince her to get the surgery done she is just like petrified about the thought that it's brain surgery about the fact that you know there is a pacemaker and and all of that and i have just not been able to convince her you know and then she's actually seen other neurologists also and you know every, practically everybody has recommended that surgery but she's just like so afraid and i mean that's understandable i mean there are com- hmm? can you talk into the mic a little bit oh i'm sorry is that better 
Okay. So, um, yeah, so I just have not been able to uh, convince her, you know, and I'm still hoping. And she's still like, I, th I think she's in her early 60s, you know. So her, she's had like this, and um, people, I have one patient who got his surgery done, who actually had a combination of essential tr uh, tremor that ultimately he also started to have some Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, and he got, um, and his symptoms were mainly on one side of the body. So he got a deep brain stimulator placed on, on one side, a gentleman in his 80s, you know, and he's done very well. He's done, and he's on a, a combination of medications for essential tremor, Parkinsonian medications, low dose, and the deep brain stimulator. And with that, he is like uh, independent in terms of activities of daily living. Yes? Are you saying that if you have essential tremor, you can go into Parkinson's? You know, that is very rare. Um, you, you don't really develop Parkinson's disease, you know, but in some people as they become older, let's say when they be go in their, uh, uh, in their 80s, you know, 80s, you know, uh, around that age, some people can develop a few Parkinsonian features. So that doesn't mean that they have Parkinson's disease, but like their tremor was like this. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, so their tremor was like this, but then when they are sitting, sometimes they have a little bit of a rest tremor as well. Nothing else, and that's about it. So the, the quality of the tremor might change a little bit with time. And uh, so it's n so I don't want, want anybody to get scared if anybody has essential tremor or if they have somebody who has essential tremor because um, essential tremor it has actually a great prognosis. Uh, it's just, you know, um, the, the, the challenge is to get onto the right medications and to address anything that happens that's happening in their life uh, to make those life, uh, lifestyle changes so that tremor intensity and severity decreases, you know. Um, what is my turn? Um, are the medications for essential tremor mainly beta blockers? No, there are many other classes as well. Beta blockers work very well in, in uh, uh, many patients. Hmm? Propanolol. Propanolol, yes. Atenolol, propanolol. Can you repeat the question? Um, she's asking if, uh, uh, if there are any other medications besides beta blockers that help essential tremor. And yes, there are many uh, medication classes. There is one medication that is generally considered to be more effective than the beta blockers, that's called primidone. And that's been around for maybe 50, maybe, hmm? primidone, P-R-I-M-I-D-O-N-E. No, no, absolutely different class, completely different class altogether. That's very effective in many people. Then there are some other medication classes. There's another one called topamirate that is uh, effective. There's another one called gabapentin. There's another one called acetazolamide. Probably like 20 years ago, you know, there was basically two medications that were effective, the, the beta blocker class and then primidone. But now over the past maybe 10 to 20 years, many more classes have become available as well. So I'm just going to again, um, you know, show a cartoon about the deep brain stimulation surgery. So this is um, those nuclei that I was talking about in the deeper part of the brain. This is the target generally in uh, Parkinson's disease, this nucleus and this nucleus. And then in essential tremor, there is another area over here called the thalamus. There is a specific nucleus in the thalamus that is the, the target of the, uh, as far as placing that electrode is concerned. So if you place it right, you know, and, and you, you kind of, um, uh, the, the surgeon uh, decides about that placement um, of that electrode uh, with, with um, um, stereotactic uh, neuroimaging, so the MRI is being done and that helps locate that spot. And then once that spot is identified, that um, you, you put the electrode and then you get like these um, the electrical discharges that are produced from that nucleus. And if you're not in the right spot, then you get these type of discharges. So let's say you're higher than where the electrode should be you'll get that. If you're lower than, let's say, where that electrode should be, these would be the discharges. But if you're in the right spot, 
then you know you will get these type of discharges in a person with parkinson's disease so then you exactly know that you know the electrode has been placed in the right spot and that will also correlate with the with the tremor stopping or the stiffness and the slowness decreasing you know in the arm for instance and then this is connected with a a, a, a wire um, uh, and then that is threaded underneath the skin and it's connected to an, uh, a pacemaker that is placed underneath the, underneath the collarbone. And so the only thing that, you, uh, that anybody else might see is a, is a little bump uh, un um, underneath the collarbone and that's about it, you know. Okay, so I'll spend a few minutes on essential tremor and all right, so essential tremor, uh, I've already mentioned quite a few features of essential tremor, but uh, I'll just um, add a few more things. It's, it's in about 60 to 70% of people, it's a genetic condition. So it's an autosomal dominant condition. So there'll be the father, the, the daughter, the son, you know, the grandson. So it, it goes from one generation to the other in about 67 to 70% of people. Um, I, I don't know if you remember the actress, the late actress Catherine Hepburn. She had like the classic um, essential tremor, and I wish that she was living in this age. She would have gotten the deep brain stimulation surgery done, and nobody would have known, you know, that she has an essential tremor. Um, very common. Um, age of onset is different between Parkinsonian disorders and essential tremor. Essential tremor, I mean, like this lady that I mentioned, you know, who uh, uh, does not want to get the deep brain stimulation surgery, she said that she noticed a tremor when she was about three or four years old. She remembers being shaky all her life. And so people say they started noticing the tremor in their 20s, 30s, and sometimes later as well. So somebody who has a very mild tremor, they might notice it um, um, you know, later on in life, 40s, 50s. But if you really ask them, OK, do you remember when you were in your 20s and you had to sing a song in front of people, did you become uh, shaky? And they would say, yes, I would become shaky. Or if they had to deliver a speech, then they would become shaky, and then it would be gone. So they have like a mild, intermittent tremor earlier on in life, you know, when they are like really stressed emotionally or physically, then it becomes manifest in a transient fashion and then it goes away. But when they get into their 40s or 50s, then it becomes um, visible and more or less constant. Um, that too can sometimes be more prominent in one hand versus the other. Uh, essential tremors are mainly head, voice, um, hands one more than the other and sometimes the whole body can be affected. Um, the head tremor can, can occur by itself. You may not have a tremor in the, in the hands or in the legs. Um, the head tremor, we call it either a yes-yes tremor or a no-no tremor. So patients, you know, their heads can go like this or their heads can go like this or it can be like a mixed mixture, like a, like a you know, oblique type of a movement as well. Um, the hand tremors are mostly very fine and they are fast. So they are about 14, 14, 12 hertz in frequency. And they are often like flexion extension tremors rather than, you know, rotatory tremors. And then the amplitude is also like, you know, fine. It's not like big. And then when you ask them to perform a task like this, so for instance, if I if you ask me to do this, you know, touch the finger, touch my nose, and if I, and to do this accurately, so what is required is that I initiate the movement, I take my hand in space, and I reach the target without my hand being shaky, and then I bring my finger back to a target that that's close to me, and then something that's far away. So I need to be able to do this with the right speed you know, with some smoothness, and then it should reach the target. And if I move the target, I should be able to do that without any shakiness. But if a person has an essential tremor or a kinetic tremor, their hand will go like this. And when they reach the target, it may become even more tremulous. And usually if they are far away, so this will be shakier, then this may be less shaky. Or, you know, the hand, if, if they're holding like, like, you know, if they're eating, you know, the spoon will shake or, you know, whatever, whatever they're holding will shake. And so that's kind of uh, the characteristic of a tremor, an essential tremor. Another feature that you know you may have you may you may you may know about is that alcohol you know usually suppresses an essential tremor and it may not have an effect 
on uh, a Parkinsonian tremor. And um, sometimes actually people with alcoholism, uh, with the essential tremor become alcoholics because it, it just decreases their, their tremor. And we use that as a diagnostic um, uh, question basically. So, you know, and anybody who comes with a tremor, the first one of the first questions I ask is that, does your tremor get better when you have a glass of wine? And they say, yes, I wanna, you know, I always wanna have a glass of wine when I'm in front of people because it calms me down. And it's not just the mental, um, you know, anxiety that may go down, the physical shakiness goes down as well, but I never prescribe alcohol, you know, to them, <laughs> for sure. Why is the alcohol possibly? I'm sorry? Why is the alcohol possibly? Yeah, you know, um, it probably is, uh, it, it decreases the tremor uh, the same way that the medications are doing that as well. Um, there are these these pathways, the basal ganglia, you know, that I had shown in the in the in the in the diagram. That there is like this circuit between the 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 thalamus, which is like one of the deeper uh, uh, basal ganglia nuclei. Then in the brainstem, there is this area uh, called the red nucleus, the red nuclei, and then there is a part of the brain in the back called the cerebellum, and then there is an area in the front called the uh, brain stem in front of the cerebellum. So there are these these connections, these pathways between the neurons in these different um, um, locations. And you know th there is an imbalance that happens in this loop, in this kind of connection, you know. And when that imbalance happens, these medications, uh, they kind of suppress, the abnormal electrical discharges that are being produced. You know, there are normal electrical discharges, and there are like it, you can think of it um, that you know that area is hyperactive. You know, a, a, too much, too many discharges are being pr produced in like a particular loop, uh, electrical uh, neuronic loop. You can think. So, so the different medication classes and alcohol is acting upon these neuronal circuits at different points and suppressing the discharges, and that's how you know, um, you know, the tremor severity decreases or it suppresses, you know, uh, the tremor. Um, oh, so once again. Uh, you know, it's another thing that I would like to mention is that magnesium depletion can also sometimes make, um, let's say, a person who has essential tremor, it can make the tremor worse. And it's very, very actually the way we are living our lives these days, we become deficient in so many uh, nutrients. Um, and, and one of them is the magnesium, you know, and um, if, we, if we lead like very healthy lives, if we eat like really healthy, you know, then we are not likely to get uh, become deficient. But if we are not, then uh, magnesium deficiency is not that um, uncommon. And if you just give them, let's say, a magnesium supplement, uh, then the tremor get, may get better. Uh, sometimes that's not enough uh, and you need medications as well. Another thing that I uh, would like to mention is that, so basically, an approach to a person with regards to treatment. So we have, uh, you know, the um, to try and identify triggers in their lifestyle. You know, things that are making the tremors worse: caffeine, lack of sleep, becoming hypoglycemic. Um, one can't run away from the world, so there is always some stress all the time. Um, so if you can address these, then the tremor will go down. Um, then there are the medications that we can try. There is the deep brain stimulation surgery. That's um, an option that can be considered in some people. And then there are some assistive devices as well that should be considered. So for instance, for somebody who has a tremor and the main difficulty that they're having is with writing, all they need to do sometimes is to use a heavy pen, like a really heavy pen. So what that does is that the heavy pen actually just pulls the muscles so that the, uh, the muscles are not able to contract and shake and it becomes easier for them to uh, use the pen. They can use um, a wrist support. So for instance, if I have a tremor in my hands and I'm trying to use the, the keyboard you know, in the, on, on, in the computer, uh, then if I use like a wrist support, let's say a wrist uh, support that is used for carpal tunnel, uh, for instance. So what that again does is it just pulls the hand down and then will we'll suppress the, you know, the amplitude of the, of the tremor. So that is, that is something uh, worth considering as well.
As far as medications are concerned, uh, we, you know, we talked about beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers are very good, but in the patient that I had mentioned, um, you know, the lady who has the depression, beta blockers can make depression worse. So they cannot be used in people who have depression, uh, asthma, uh, diabetes, uh, low blood pressure. You know, so those are kind of contraindications. People who have high blood pressure and they have an essential tremor, then this is the perfect drug because it will control the blood pressure as well as it will control the tremor. So there are some instances when it, it really is very uh, good to use. Um, another category, primidone that I just mentioned. It's, uh, primidone is, an, is a barbiturate and um, it, it has to be used judiciously. However, in, in, in most people with an essential tremor, it works great. All you need to do is to take a small dose, sometimes a higher dose at night, and the tremor can either be controlled uh, completely or at least very well. Um, some people can't tolerate it. It's like, it, it, it's like, you know, some people will have, let's say, a small glass of like, uh, champagne, for instance, or wine and um, they will become drunk with that small little glass and another person can have two bottles of whiskey and you will not even be i mean they they would not even become shaky with that so why why does that happen that happens because of the way the alcohol is metabolized in those two individuals and some people you know the metabolism is really you know, good and so the, the you know the the um, alcohol can be metabolized and in other people it's not and so the side effects are determined by that and the same is true for medication so in somebody who is using primidone you know their tremor they'll use the right dose the tremor will be well controlled and some people even a tiny dose just taken at night will cause them to have a hangover the next day will cause them to feel drowsy or mentally just not be as sh as sharp and they they you know just can't um, um, you know tolerate it these are the other medications that can also help people with uh, essential tremor GABA, gabapentin uh, you may have heard of it it's used for many other conditions as well pain pain mm -hmm. is the primidone uh, uh, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, there. I'm sorry. You couldn't take it. On no, no. It, no. It, it is taken on a continuous basis. It it can be taken for life. You know. It's like it's a condition. I mean, it's a it's a medication. If it is used used judiciously, um, it doesn't cause any side effects at all. No side effects at all. No short term, long term side effects. People live perfectly normal lives. They can, the tremors are so well controlled that nobody knows that they have a tremor, including themselves, and and that's it. But they need it for the rest of their life. So do you are you do you call that uh, is that a habit? No, that's their need. But um, it's like you know needing a blood pressure medication for the rest of one's life. Needing a a um, uh, a diabetes medication for the rest of their life. It is harder to get off. Uh, primidone than it would be for a blood pressure medication because um, you develop like tolerance and you, you know it's hard you can get like withdrawal effects like you can get you can get with uh, narcotics or you can get with benzodiazepines like uh, Ativan and those medications so it's kind of in in that class you know um, benzodiazepines um, narcotics and um, and barbiturates you know those uh, these are those classes that can be habit forming and, ad and addicting um, so you have to use them judiciously and and you know they have to be prescribed by people who um, are you kind of kind of um, uh, experienced with using them you have to be very sure whether they're not causing any side effects in elderly people in particularly you have to be very careful because if they are drowsy in the middle of the night they can fall down and break their hip so it's better to be a little shaky during the day rather than fall down and break you know your hip so you have to use them you know and, and then all make sure that you know people 
who have essential tremor are often drinking alcohol. So you have to make sure that once they are on primidone, they're also not drinking excessively. Because you, if you combine two medications that inhibit the nervous system, then you can develop you know, problems. You know, that can cause lowering of the blood pressure, that can affect the respiratory system, so the breathing can get affected. So I mean, all these factors have to be taken uh, into consideration. But uh, again, in the majority of people, they respond beautifully and you know their symptoms are controlled very, very well. I, I have some musicians who have essential tremor and they, you know, they're pianists, they have, you know, they, they really need their hands to be like perfectly still, you know. I have, I can think of two people who are singers and they have essential tremor, you know. So they, they actually, when they were younger, they didn't have it. And, and the little bit of resonance that they had in their voice added to the beauty of their songs, you know. But then as they become, became older, then, you know, they, you could actually, it, it, you know, it seemed kind of as if, you know, their voice was shaky rather than, you know, they were trying to, you know, create a note that was um, a little shaky. Mm -hmm. Is it um, You know, I, I would say there's no yes or no to that. Uh, it behaves differently in practically everybody. There are people. Who, um, the, the lady said that uh, does essential tremor progress as the person becomes older? Does everybody, you know, progress? So um, uh, uh, yes and no. In some people, they may have a, a tremor and it may remain the same most of their lives. You know, they find out what works the best for them they get on those medications or whatever else and then they're fine and maybe there may be you know sometimes when they are stressed it may become slightly more pronounced then it goes back to their baseline and that's how they are <clears throat> and in some people as they age you know it, it progresses and uh, then you know initially maybe all they need is a small dose of propanolol or a small dose of primidone then, then you may need two medications or higher doses or you may need a combination of surgeries and medications. Um, a good thing is that there have been studies that have actually shown that <clears throat> essential tremor, uh, most people with essential tremor live longer lives than, than an average person. So, uh, you know, a lot of people live up to their 80s and 90s, you know, people who have um, essential tremor in their um, in their families. So longevity is kind of um, uh, associated with the central tremor. And then sometimes there is a slightly higher fa uh, family history of deafness as well in people who have a central tremor as well. Why the longevity associated with the problem? Don't know. Isn't that interesting? Don't know. She's, uh, she's asking why do people live longer lives, people who have a central tremor. Don't know. Don't know. I, that that I, uh, is, I don't think is known. Yeah. Uh, but still, I, I don't want an essential tremor. <laughs> and in some people, there are other medication classes that can be helpful if the other ones, the ones that I'd mentioned before, cannot be used for whatever reason. They're not working, they're causing side effects. Gabapentin, topimerate, benzodiazepines can be used on an as needed basis. Um, so, you know, there, there, there may be a person who wants to do a performance, nothing else seems to be working that well or causing side effects, he uses one dose of uh, Ativan. You know, he, he does his performance and then that's fine. So maybe once a week he uses Ativan and that's it. You know, I had one gentleman uh, who was a, a church organ player and he had a really bad essential tremor and he could not tolerate the uh, medications uh, he could not take a medication every day. If he took medications every day, and in his case, primidone worked the best. So if he took primidone every day, then he could not function, even with the lowest dose. So what he would do is the day before, I think the day before or the morning before, I'm forgetting, he would take like a few pills of primidone. Like, you know, usually you're taking like, I'm not recommending this to anybody, this is what he would do. So he would take like, three or four pills of primidone a few hours before the performance. He would do his performance, maybe a little bit drowsy, and then he would sleep for the next 24 hours, and then he would be shaky. <laughs> then he would, you know, 
be ready for his next performance. <coughs> How much does uh, arthritis affect ETs? Um, <clears throat> I don't think there is a like a cause and effect relationship with arthritis. However, you know, if if a person is shaky, uh, are you talking? Are you just talking about tremors, or just specifically essential tremor? Uh, the gentleman is asking, uh, you know. Does um, arthritis have an effect, or is there a relationship between arthritis and tremors, or just a central tremor? Just a central tremor, or just tremors? Essential tremor. Essential tremor. Um, yeah, so I don't think that there is a relationship between essential tremor and arthritis per se. But if, let's say, I'm right-handed, and the tremor is predominantly affecting my left hand, so I will maybe use my right hand to perform most tasks because that just you know is easier for me so then i would be using my left hand less and less and if if i use any body part less than however much i should then there'll be some disuse arthritis that may develop as time passes you know so that's one possibility um, but otherwise i do not know of a direct uh, relationship cause and effect relationship um, Sometimes if a body part is shaking too much, then there can be excessive wear and tear uh, on those joints theoretically. But generally speaking, you know, those movements are not that pronounced that they would cause like osteoarthritis. You know, let's say if a, if a hand is shaky like this, I don't think that that would actually result in um, a clinical osteoarthritis. Yes, there'd be a little bit more wear and tear. Um, in people who have Parkinson's disease and a tremor associated with it, it's often associated with arthritis in, 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 in a joint, of, uh, in, in the limb that is affected by not just the tremor, but slowness and stiffness, you know, so the arm is kind of more or less held like this and shaky. So those people often have arthritis of the shoulder joint um, in particular, and that joint hurts as well. Um, botulinum toxin, Botox. Have you heard about that? Yes. That sometimes they can be that can be used in in um, in people who have tremors as well. And I I've used it in some of my patients who've not been able to tolerate oral medications. You know, and in some people it works great and it lasts for about four months on an average. And some people um, uh, longer than that. So uh, I'll give you an example. I have this one. Uh, well, actually, you know what? She doesn't have tremor. She has another movement disorder, so it's all right. So now somebody, yeah, yes. Yes, um, of all of the medications that you've listed and mentioned, which of those medications have the fewest side effects? Because there's so much research about the side effects and um, Which medications, uh, medication or medications have fewer side effects from the ones that uh, I've mentioned? <clears throat> Generally speaking, the Parkinsonian medications cause more side effects compared to the medications that are used for essential tremor. <clears throat> Generally speaking, uh, the, the medications that are used for Parkinson's disease cause more side effects than those that are used for essential tremor. Um, maybe beta blockers cause uh, fewer side effects but it really depends upon the age and what else the person has you know with regards to comorbidities so if a person is older the person has other diseases the person is taking two or three other medications you know for something else so that will be like then a cumulative uh, effect like side effects will be like cumulative so it's hard to generalize you know but if i uh, well I think if I have, you know, I have a patient who comes in for the first time and there's, there's no other major um, comorbidity to consider, if it is an older patient, I would generally begin with a beta blocker. If it's a younger patient, I would generally begin uh, propanolol, atenolol, um, yeah, so those are some of the atenolol, yeah. Propanolol, it's also called Indorol. Indorol is the trade name. What about toporol? Toporol too, yes, yes. Uh, prob the, the most of the studies have been done on propanolol, Indorol, so we have more data about it. Uh, beta blockers can be divided into two classes, those that predominantly affect um, the heart and the cardiovascular system and those that are 
affecting other parts of the body as well. Those types of beta blockers like propanolol that have a general effect on the body work better on uh, tremor. So uh, probably propanolol is the best medication to try, to try, you know, in, in people with, uh, with essential tremor. Okay, so that uh, is the conclusion of my talk. And if there are any quest further questions, I'll be happy to answer them or I'll try and answer them. Yes, ma'am? Uh, um, what about um, on the nutritional side of things? If you take DHA, healthy oils, for the problem to feed the brain, healthy oils like DHA, um, I've been told that, that I should take more of that for feeding the brain and um, anything for the nervous, you know, just for nerves. Yeah, so the lady is asking if anything nutritional um, or supplements, vitamins, you know, those type, those type of things, um, you know, how, what you eat, uh, what type of um, what type of food you have, you know, what are the oils that you use, vitamins, those things can make a difference with regards to, um, uh, you know, improving tremors. You know, I, I, my answer to that would be like, an, uh, based on anecdotal, um, it won't be like, you know, I'm not going to quote science and say, okay, you know, taking DHA or, you know, taking this supplement and that helps tremors because I'm not aware of, you know, such a study that would that proves that. However, my own personal experience is that the whatever it takes with regards to food, supplements, vitamins, and not just what you put in your mouth, but proper sleep, exercise, meditation, you know, everything that you need your uh, that you need for your body to thrive, you know, whether it's whether to thrive spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, physically in any of those areas so whatever it takes um, if you do that you know if you have that perfect right combination most of the time and one can't get it right all the time obviously um, then the tremor is likely to get better so you know it's like it's like a, a, a car you keep it in good order overall so it's less likely to be rickety and shaky you know and and if, and if you just you know just put it in overall general good condition oil it well etc etc it's just likely to be less you know rickety when it's even on you know uh, a road that is a little um, bumpy you know so um, you know I would recommend if anybody has a tremor you know so in addition to whatever is causing the tremor in addition to whatever is happening um, it would be very, very important to make sure that you are not deficient in any of the uh, vitamins and supplements, you know, that you were mentioning that are important for neurologic health. And in particular, these are the B vitamins, so vitamin B12, vitamin B1, you know, like for, I'll give you an example. So people, uh, people who are alcoholics, they often get uh, deficient in vitamin B1, which is thiamine. And one of the um, symptoms of thiamine deficiency and alcoholism is becoming shaky. So if they are going through an alcohol withdrawal, you know, they become shaky or if they are too in intoxicated, then they can get shaky. So um, the, the B vitamins, B1, which is thiamine, uh, B6 is another uh, important vitamin for good um, neurologic health. Uh, actually, all the vitamins, folates are extremely important. Folic acid is extremely important. Uh, magnesium is very important. Um, B12 extremely important. You know, you know, if I see let's say a hundred people in a month's time, I, I'll tell you, in every age group, I have uh, practically I would say ninety five percent of people have a B12 deficiency. You know, and you recognize that, you correct it. And it's not just their neurologic symptoms improve. Sometimes, you know, um, arthritic pain improves. You know, just some non, you just have like a sense of uh, well being. They just, their mood elevates. And it's not just important to uh, measure the level of the B12 in the, in the blood, it has to be <clears throat> a high normal. So, 
um, if it's below I would say 900 it may be worth treating it you know so the range is between approximately 300 to 11 1200 so if it's around a thousand and above then that's like a good number and it, it should be tested with uh, two other um, um, kind of uh, levels methyl melanic acid in the blood and in the urine and if you if, if these are abnormal uh, then a person can have a b12 deficiency b12 levels may be normal so if methyl melanic acid levels are abnormal then a person can still have b12 deficiency so very very and as we become older then our gastrointestinal tract cannot absorb even if you eat the best diet it cannot absorb as well as you know a, a 20 year old person's gastrointestinal tract will so often even if you lead pretty healthy lives there's a pretty good chance you know we may be deficient in this or that so it would be important to uh, think about it and address it but i would not recommend that blindly take multiple uh, multivitamins and vitamins because sometimes there are certain vitamins if you take too much of those that can cause side effects as well uh, vitamin d is another uh, vitamin that I, I have yet to meet a person who has an absolutely perfect D level and that's mainly because we are spending our lives indoors and that too is uh, a very very important vitamin for our uh, neurologic you know well-being um, and then just spending most of your time outside you know would take care of its exposure to sun will take care of that. Thank you for your comprehensive answer it was good. Oh, um, so uh, yeah, the gentleman is asking if marijuana is helpful in tremors. Is that your question? Um, you know, I do not know of a study that has actually been done to um, uh, you know show whether marijuana is helpful or not. But I would not be surprised if it turns out that it is helpful because there is no doubt about the fact that marijuana helps anxiety. And a, and a lot of people with tremors, essential tremor or whatever, if they are anxious, you know, it's like the chicken and egg, what comes first, you don't know. Sometimes you have a tremor and because you are stressed, you become anxious and the tremor gets worse and the anxiety gets worse and you don't know what is coming uh, first, you know. So um, uh, anxiety uh, does get better with marijuana. A lot of people say that, you know, who use medicinal marijuana or, or who use um, uh, recreation marijuana. So if um, uh, marijuana uh, um, suppresses um, anxiety and secondarily uh, improves tremor, then maybe that's the case and it may happen in some people. However, you know, because of the um, the risks for addiction and all of that, you, you have to again use that judiciously as well and it is available <coughs> in a medicinal form, you know, and there are doctors who are experienced in using it and, you know, people who have terminal cancer and, you know, in certain, um, um, you know, uh, medical conditions, you know, it may be worth considering it if not, nothing else works, you know, uh, then actually maybe it may be a milder medication than uh, primidone because primidone is um, about barbiturate and then the only difference is that marijuana has this, you know, uh, taboo attached to it but you know if a person is taking primidone um, nobody will question that you know yeah. you take primidone and propenerol yes I have some patients who are on both yeah 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 absolutely yes um, what if the, um, the tremors are caused by a medication like Depakote or Synthroid that you have to take so you can put these other medications on top of that um, well, first I would consider alternatives. So Depakote is a seizure medication. Depakote is used for bipolar disorder. There are so many other good medications that control seizures as well and, and you know behavioral problems. It's used for migraines. It's used for um, Tourette syndrome. I mean, there are many things that Depakote is used for, but there are like so many other alternatives that are available as well. So I would first... Huh? In this case, it's for bipolar. Bipolar, yeah. So bipolar, you know, there's great medications for bipolar as well that are available. So, um, uh, Topamax, um, uh, um, the atypical neuroleptics, um, like Risperidone, um, 
you have um, lamotrigine, um, you have tegretol. Uh, there, there are there are medications. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I know that there are many other alternatives. So I would, uh, before adding another medication, because you know, then that that cause. I mean, the more medications you have on board, you know, the more side effects are uh, likely to happen. So um, I think. So I, are you saying that that Depakote causes may cause tremors, but those others that you're talking about don't? There are some uh, medications that are used for bipolar disorder that do not cause tremor, or they will not. Some people have a mild essential tremor, and then when they get on Depakote, then they they become shaky, or their their tremor uh, their tremor worsens. So um, there are, um, you know, there, there are many, you know, medications. Some do not aggravate uh, the tremor or do not cause the tremor. Uh, so it may be worth exploring that, you know, before before moving before adding a medication, you know, definitely. Maybe we can speak with you after the seminar. Sure, and, and and then you know, in some people you have to take more than one medication, and sometimes you know you take like you kind of balance the dose. Maybe um, you know there are there are things that can be. Uh, tried you know and um, uh, there are possibilities and then besides Depakote do you have any other medication in mind or, or yeah you should measure Synthroid yeah um, so even the the thyroid medications you have to take them you know if you have to take them you have to take them and um, I don't think there's an alternative for thyroid medication so with that you, you a person probably has to take another medication you know uh, for for the tremor if the tremor is um, you know uh, disabling yeah so, uh, but you know, before moving on to medications, I would first do the non-medicinal thing. You know, make sure you are not becoming hypoglycemic. Make sure that you're sleeping well. Sleep deprivation causes. Uh, if a person has a mild tremor, it will become uh, a moderately severe tremor just that day that he has not slept well. It's possible. Um, yes. It seems from my internet reading that there is no specific drug that was originally and only designed for tremor. So if all the drugs have side effects based on their central nervous system or antidepressant, is that fair to say? Um, In other words, it said there, I went to the uh, tremor website for the tremor society, it said there is no drug specifically for tremor. In other words, however, some other drugs do, as you've been pointing out, develop. But the side effects seem to be the issue. I tried an antidepressant for a couple of days. It really hated it. So Which one did you try? I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. Oh, I've I never see. heard of it. I'm a musician, I'm a guitarist, and I'm having the same problem. Uh, what kind of an instrument do you play? I play for my girl and classical guitar. I also have neuropathy, which mm -hmm. I still have to play. A, a classical guitar, huh? That's what you play, I see. I see, yeah. So, but but there are like so many medica other medications. I mean, if you've tried one, you know there are many others that you could try. Yeah. So your if your diagnosis is essential tremor, you know, and so beta blocker or primidone, you know, those were the two. Hmm? Yeah. Any drug can have serious side effects. You really have to, you know consider the pros and cons. I mean, even vitamins have side effects. If a person needs eight glasses of water, if you drink 20, you're more likely to get in, in the hospital rather than taking primidone, you know? So there's nothing that has, uh, the only thing that does not have side effects is placebo. So, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you get something, you know, like a placebo will probably help, you know, <laughs> it will not harm anybody. But besides that, anything can have side effects. But you know, these the, the tremor medications usually in the majority of people, uh, you know, they, they can be tolerated quite well. You just have to individualize them. You know, look at you know what their age is, what other medical problems are there, what um, side effects they've experienced in the past, how they react to alcohol, etc. So if you take you know factor in everything else, you know, then usually you are able to find something that may. Help. I mean, the only, you know, uh, you know, I, I, my my subspecialty is movement disorders. That's I've seen tremors, you know, since I've become a doctor many many years ago, and except for this lady that I mentioned, you know, um, I I you know I, I think everybody that I can remember has, if the tremors have not been controlled entirely, they've improved, you know in a reasonably meaningful manner, you know. I, I can't remember, Parkinson's is tougher, much, much tougher to, to deal with. Um, 
Um, but you know, it, it, in any patient, you know, managing a trauma can be challenging as well. Yeah. Yeah. To ask again because I think you've given so much. But mm -hmm. um, what about the combination of facial mask and tremors, head and hands? Is that also uh, is that more complicated? You mean uh, having like like uh, not uh, not having a very expressive face? You mean? Yeah. Um, that usually doesn't happen in essential tremor. That's kind of a feature of Parkinsonism. You know, so if you if a person has a tremor, which is a tremor at rest and has um, you know a facial expressiveness is not there, you know, then it may be a good idea to see if you know that's like a touch of Parkinsonism that they have. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Th 30 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that dangerous? No, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. Has it helped? It helps. It doesn't cure totally, but it helps. Well, that's, yeah, that's great. That's great. So, um, um, well, that you're, you're like, you know, an example. 30 years is a long time, and, you know, you look yeah. perfectly fine to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. A uh, more basic question, if one drinks uh, like a couple cups of coffee every day or several glasses of Coca-Cola every day, can they develop a tremor? Um, yes. So um, I consider Coca-Cola and any of the beverages, the sodas, worse than marijuana and tobacco and um, I think probably heroin is worse than the sodas but they have nothing but poison in them i would i would not touch them for the rest of your life they are full of poison but they're delicious hmm? but they're delicious well i don't know there are a lot of delicious things that are poisonous so i wouldn't touch them yeah. at what age you said that the central tremor comes with an age at a particular age Usually uh, earlier on, and then um, first, second, third decades of life in most people, but then in some people later on, you know, it be may become manifest as well. Yeah. But generally earlier compared to people who have a Parkinsonian trauma. Why is it called essential tremor? I'm not being facetious, I don't find it essential at all. <laughs> when I was first diagnosed with the condition about 15 years ago, my uh, internist diagnosed it as involuntary tremor, and subsequently the medical profession has chosen to change the designation to essential. I don't find it essential. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Uh, the need to change the the, the term. Yeah. Excuse me. I, I think you're you're right. I mean, there's no need for that word, basically. Yeah. So it should be changed to involuntary, involuntary or tremor. Yeah. Or. Uh, Ki kinetic tremor or my pleasure my pleasure thank you for your attention